This Christmas Eve, we are in Matthew's Gospel. Turn with me in your Bibles, if you would, to the second chapter of Matthew's Gospel, Matthew 2. We will begin by looking at verses 1 down through the end of 12. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all of the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, and then they quote here, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, and said, Go, and search diligently for the young child. And when ye have found him, bring me word again, that I may come and worship him also. When they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star, which they saw in the east, went before them, till it came and stood over where the young child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned of God in a dream, that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. There are three categories of people in this passage, and they all receive the same good news. All of them are exposed to the same truth, and that is that Messiah has come at last. The three categories of people that we find in this story, the same three categories of people that we find throughout the history of the world, the same three categories of people that exist even this Christmas Eve 2020, and here they are. What kinds of people receive the news of Christ? They fit into one of these categories. They are either enemies, they are cowards, or they are believers. Everyone who hears the gospel, the news of Christ's coming, the, who, who is, receives the promise that those who believe in him can be reconciled to God because their sins will be forgiven, they fall into one of these three categories. They are either enemies, they are cowards, or they are believers. And depending upon which three categories, which of the three, I should say, which of the three categories they fall into, that determines their response. Let's begin by looking at enemies. And of course, the preeminent enemy to this news is Herod, the quote unquote King of the Jews. Now, Herod is known to us throughout history as Herod the Great, uh, but I will be the first to tell you this evening he would in no way, shape, or form win any kind of humanitarian award. Herod was called the Great. He became known as the Great. He, he receives that epithet to his name, not because of his person or his generosity, certainly not because of his uh, religious adherence or, or anything like that. No, Herod, Herod the King had a penchant for enormous building projects. The only thing that was great about him was his ability to spend money, and even that was probably matched only by his, uh, the only thing that would have been darkly great about him was his ability and passion for killing people. Let me tell you a bit about King Herod. Herod, first off, although being king of the Jews, was not technically a Jew himself. He was an outsider. From what history is able to tell us, Herod was born around the year 72 BC 
in an area south of Judea called Idumea. He was not a Jew, although he had been converted to Judaism through his father. Ethnically, Herod was actually an Arab from both his mother and his father's side. Now, he was raised Jewish. That is to say, his father had converted, and then he had been raised in the knowledge of the Old Testament. I'm not sure to what degree, but he had been raised a Jew. Um, some historians have said he, he would have even been circumcised. So he's technically circumcised into the covenant, but... He's not a Jew by birth, and he's certainly not a Jew by action. There is absolutely nothing righteous. Whatever he has received in terms of schooling about the one true living God, about the, the law that God has passed down, about the story of the Jewish people, none of it has informed his person. And the proof of that, the fruits of that, are clearly demonstrated in the rest of his life. Now... Herod's father, we need to understand, was a local ruler in that part of the world at that time, around seven decades before Christ's coming. His father was in very good standing with Julius Caesar. The same Julius Caesar in the Shakespeare play, the same Julius Caesar who conquered Britain. I came, I saw, I conquered that Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar, he was good friends with Herod's father. And so as a result, Herod ends up being appointed the governor of Galilee. And this happens sometime around 47 BC. He's maybe 25, 26 years old. And so the powers at Rome, because he's a son of a good friend of the Caesar, give him basically a very cushy position overseeing part of the empire. Now, it wasn't all smooth sailing for young Herod receives this position in 47 BC, and about five or six years later, there's a, uh, a revolt. Herod and one of his brother, by this time, have been named what are called tetrarchs. They've, they've um, started as governors, they're kind of moving up the ranks, so to speak, within the empire. So they're, they're gaining influence and control over larger and larger parts of territories. By 41 BC, he and his brother are now tetrarchs in the region. And they have received this honor, not from Julius Caesar, but from the man who ended up replacing Julius Caesar, if you remember your Roman history from your long ago grade school. They received this honor from Mark Antony. So by 41 BC, young Herod the Great seems to be moving along quite well. And then all of a sudden, as happens in this part of the world, there is a power struggle in the region, and Herod is forced to flee to Rome for help because he loses control of the area. He goes to Rome, his cries are heard and acknowledged, and the Roman Senate gives him this title, King of the Jews, which then empowers him, as well as some military support, empowers Herod the king to go back to Judea and over the next three or four years physically and very bloodily seize control of it once and for all. So let it be noted that Herod the king of the Jews is A, not really a Jew, and B, not really their king. Herod is not, Herod is not out of the line of David, not even tangentially. He is an outsider who has received a title from a conquering power. He's really not king of the Jews. He's a vassal of Rome. So Herod, king of the Jews, vassal of Rome, seizes full and total control of the area of Judea about three decades before the events that we've just read, about three decades before the birth of Christ. Now, as we've said, Herod now holds this title of king, but he is a puppet. He is a puppet ruler. He is answerable to the real supreme authority in this day and age, which is Caesar, whoever it is that's sitting on the throne in Rome, whoever it is that is ruling the empire. Herod answers to that person. And this is because... This is how Rome operated. 
Part of the Roman success strategy was to conquer regions, but then to let said region more or less rule itself without a lot of interference. Yes, there would have been a military presence there. We know that there were centurions, the Bible even talks about some of them who eventually come to faith in Christ. So yes, there was definitely and always a military presence there, but in terms of the governing, Rome was actually quite content to give local rulers a leash of varying length by which to rule the people. The only thing that said local rulers had to make sure that they did was to ensure the constant and uninterrupted flow of tax money. Rome was always about the money. So they had to make sure that they were contributing to the tax, or rather, they had to make sure that they were contributing to the coffers through their taxes, and local rulers were in charge of making sure that the Pax Romana, the Roman peace, was upheld. So, whoever you were, if you were governing a part of the Roman Empire, as long as the money rolled in, and as long as the people weren't in open revolt, you could pretty much do as you wanted. And Herod did exactly this. Even though he was a vassal king under the thumb of Rome, he still enjoyed a pretty free hand because the money kept rolling in, and at this point in time, the people were not in open revolution. And so he exploited that freedom to the hilt and quickly became a despot. Starting almost immediately, when he rolls back in in 37 BC, Herod the Great becomes Herod the Despot. Now, he was married when he first shows up. He comes back from Rome. He is married to a woman named Doris. And once he secures this territory, one of his very first actions as cemented king is to get rid of Doris. And to exile not only her, but also their son. And then... To cement his role as king of the Jews, once his first wife is gone and his son and potential heir through that son is gone and exiled, he marries a Hasmodean princess, and her name is Mariamne. Now, historians tell us that Herod the Great, for all his awfulness, actually did love this woman. However, that didn't stop him from sometime later murdering her and her two sons and her brother and her grandfather and her mother all because he feared that they were eventually plotting against him. Herod was a despot. He was also nervous constantly that he, someone was coming, sneaking up behind him to overthrow and usurp him. And he wouldn't brook that. He wouldn't even allow the possibility for that. And if that meant that he had to murder his second wife and all of her family, so be it. Herod would actually go on to marry seven more times after that. If you can imagine these poor women, seven more times after that. His despotism wasn't contained solely within his own household either. He suppressed the people the whole time he was on the throne, quote-unquote. And he did all this in the name of national security. See, it doesn't matter whether it's today or 2,000 years ago. It's always in the interests of the nation that the people are kept down. He suppressed the people. He used secret police to monitor the people. He was always looking for avenues, agencies that were looking to promote insurrection against him. His ridiculous anxiety and fear of being overthrown led him to eventually have a bodyguard of over 2,000 men. And he needed this not simply because people were plotting to overthrow him, and not purely because they hated him. Well, they, well, they hated him, but it was because he taxed the people so heavily that they hated him. He needed a bodyguard of 2,000 men because eventually his taxation became such a burden on the populace that there were legitimate plots against him to overthrow or even just straight out kill him. What was Herod doing with all that money? Well, this is where he gets the epithet, the great. He needed all of this money not only to pay Rome its due, not only to live his own lavish lifestyle, but also to finance these massive and many building projects. Herod loved building things, and he never did anything small. He constructed fortresses. He constructed seaside ports, and he used the 
the latest in, in, uh, in first century technology, when they constructed the docks and piers, for example, at the port city of Caesarea, they, they, they actually formed underwater concrete. But his most and maybe greatest and long-lasting achievement was this. Herod is the one responsible for the expansion of the Second Temple in Jerusalem. Now you'll recall, if you think about the, all the times in the Gospels, when Jesus is there, when uh, the, the young family goes there, Mary, when he, he, they, they are visited, they see Simeon. Um, Jesus is there at age 12. Jesus is there decades later with the disciples. All the times that the that the, the gospel narratives move to the second temple. And you'll remember it's described as being beautiful and enormous. It's got vast outer courts. There's the, this is where the money changers, for example, yes, set up. They set up in this vast outer court, and then there's a court of the women, and there's a court of the Gentiles, and then there's an inner court that only men can go into. And then beyond that, you actually started to get closer to the temple. It was this massive, sprawling complex atop a flattened mountain. Well, all of that is thanks to Herod. The splendor of this place is thanks to Herod. A thousand priests were employed as masons and carpenters over a number of decades. Historians tell us that the majority of the work actually on the, um, on the temple itself... I guess somebody was cracking the whips. That got done within about 18 months, unheard of. But that beyond that, all of these additional courts and walls and everything else, all the accoutrements that, that were built onto it, they went on for decades. Now make no mistake, none of this was being spurred on by Herod's love for God. None of this was a case or a, a callback to Solomon who built the first temple and desired only the biggest and the best for the house of God? That's not the case here. This was all about Herod. We know this because the temple eventually becomes known as Herod's temple. Not that he's being worshipped there, but he's the one responsible for its size and its grandeur, which is exactly what he wanted in the first place. Herod wanted to be remembered as great, and to ensure that he would be, he built great things, great projects. Now Herod was ill, very ill at the end of his life. He came down with, no one is exactly sure what, but it was an excruciatingly painful, putrefying illness, something in his gut. And as I say, no one is exactly certain what it was. It has gone down in posterity simply as Herod's evil. Whatever this was, Herod was struck down by evil. Quite deservedly. The Jewish historian Josephus, in fact, makes mention that the pain of this affliction, whatever it was, reached so great a point that Herod actually tried to stab himself to death to alleviate it. Josephus also states that Herod, I guess knowing that the end was nigh, became so concerned that when he died, no one would mourn him. And they wouldn't have. So, as the final kick of the can, Herod the Great did this. He commanded that a large group of distinguished, well-loved men come to a city near Jerusalem, Jericho invited all these great men, and then, once they had all arrived, he gave orders to his 2,000 bodyguards and his secret police to have them all killed when he died. So, whenever he died, that was the signal all of these great distinguished men were to also be murdered. What was he trying to accomplish through all of this? Well, he knew that, if nothing else, all of those great distinguished men whom he had invited to Jericho, they would be mourned. And their friends and families, their cries would go up into the streets and throughout the countryside. And so at least, if nothing else, what he was trying to gain was some coincidental grief. Herod was definitely an enemy of the good news. How do we know? Well, just look at his reaction here. When he had heard these things, this is Matthew 
2, this is verse 3, when he had heard these things, that finally has been born the king of the Jews, and incidentally, there's no mistaking what this means. This is long-awaited Messiah. And Herod's no dunce for all his awful behavior, for all his wickedness, for all his feigned righteousness, for all of his naked ungodliness. He is no idiot. When magi from the east show up and say, hey, we know there's been a sign in the heavens proving it to be true, where is born finally the king of the Jews? He knows exactly what they mean. This is the actual Messiah. This will be a king out of the lineage of David. Another way to put it, if you're Herod at this point in time, now has finally been born Israel's legitimate king. A king who has that title legitimately, not because it has been bestowed upon him by a foreign occupying power a thousand miles away. Where is born the king of the Jews? What happens at verse 3? When he hears these things, he is troubled, to put it mildly. Yes? Troubled, worried. His anxiety and suspicions kick into overdrive. Here, finally, by divine promise, is the king that has every right and God's blessing to kick him off the throne. Troubled, to put it mildly. And not just him, right? When a man like Herod the king is troubled, all Jerusalem is also troubled. Now, all Jerusalem may have been troubled for a lot of reasons. Are we looking at a power struggle within the next few decades between Herod and Rome? and the rightful Davidic king? And if we are looking at a legitimate power struggle, what side are you on? How do you feel about that? Make no mistake, many would have dreaded it because there's inevitably going to be bloodshed and uprising. But many, maybe many more, would have been looking forward to it. Finally, the king will defeat our worldly enemies. Some would have been troubled because Herod being Herod and the people knowing Herod, there's going to be blood. Herod will do anything and everything to stop this from happening, to stop the rightful king from deposing him. So Herod is troubled. All of Jerusalem is also troubled. Storm clouds are gathering with this news. But Herod is not a storm cloud to the news of Christ's birth. Herod is an enemy. He has no intention whatsoever, despite what he says down here in verse 8, has no intention of worshipping the child when he is found. He has every intention of sending his spies, assassins, and bodyguards to murder the child. How do we know this for sure? Well, flash forward, go down a few more verses, because the Lord comes to Joseph in a dream at verse 13, and admits the danger, the pressing danger of Christ, the infant Christ's murder. And so, to prevent this from happening, Joseph is to take Mary and the young Christ, and they are to flee the country. They are, in fact, to go into Egypt, and they are to wait there until they receive word that it's safe to come back. And they only come back, if you read further into this chapter, they only come back once Herod is dead. Once Herod is dead, the danger has passed for the time being. Then they return. Now this, coincidentally, this coming out of Egypt also, Matthew wants you to point out, um, also fulfills, down at 17, a word of prophecy written in the book of Jeremiah. So it all falls into place. But the danger is very real. Herod does not want to worship the Christ child. Herod wants to murder the Christ child. He wants to eliminate the potential for his being kicked off the throne before it even happens. And what does it say of Herod's character that he has absolutely no compulsion or hesitation towards murdering a child under the age of two? In fact, to ensure that he gets them all, down here, he just orders, ah, kill everyone, kill every male child in Bethlehem under the age of two. This goes down in history as the murder of the innocents. Herod is an enemy of the good news. But he's not alone. 
he wasn't alone then. He's never been alone through history. And regrettably, and it breaks my heart, but he is not alone even today. There are many, many, who count themselves, as Paul would write, enemies of the cross. They are enemies of Christ. They are enemies of the good news. They don't want to hear it. They want nothing to do with it. And in the worst instances, they actually seek to actively work against it. So there are enemies. i got to move on. Oh, Braden. You get so excited, you just blather on. There are enemies of the good news. That's the first category. The second category of people who receive the good news, and I want us to, to note how they react, are cowards. Again, there are cowards in these 12 verses. There have been cowards throughout history. There are cowards even today. There will be cowards and enemies and believers, but there will be cowards till Christ return and history ends. There will always be these three categories of people. There will always be enemies. There are enemies today. There will always be cowards. There are cowards today. There are those who hear the news of Christ. There are those who hear the gospel. And even if they acknowledge the truth of it, don't act on it. They are cowardly. Who are the cowards in these 12 verses, Braden? Well, they are the scribes and the Pharisees. Turn your attention now. Herod has received the news. And in verse 4, he gathers here, they're called the chief priests and the scribes. These are the lawyers, the religious leaders. These would have been members of very likely of all of the various political, uh, religious political parties. So we've got Pharisees in here, we've got scribes. We may have even had summoned from the temple some of the Sadducees. They are all come together. These are the men, the, the priests in the temple, th those who study the law, those who know the Old Testament. They, they know the Jewish Bible backwards and forwards. So they are the ones who are called before the king, quote-unquote, and he says, where is Christ going to be born? This is clearly, he acknowledges, the final, at last, the fulfillment of God's prophecy. So you're the ones who know the words of the prophets as they have been written down in God's word. Where will this happen? Where in the land? In verse 5, they say to him, and I, this was a no-brainer for them. This was a no-brainer for them. They said it'll happen in Bethlehem of Judea. And then they quote the prophet. They actually quote Micah. The minor prophet Micah 5 too. he's the one who talks about where Messiah will come from. They quote him, and they say, well, it's, it's going to be Bethlehem. It's always going to have been Bethlehem. Now, is Bethlehem, Bethlehem far, far away? No, Bethlehem is six miles to the south a bit of Jerusalem. Bethlehem is a suburb, we could say, of Jerusalem. You can literally get there in half a day if you walk, less if you are say, on a horse or in a, in a cart. Three hours for anyone of influence to get to Bethlehem. It's not hard. They don't have to cross oceans. They don't have to climb mountains. It's quite literally in their backyard. And they have known that it would always be there. Chief priests, scribes, calls them together. Where is the Messiah going to be born? They say, Bethlehem. How do we know this? It's here. Let us quote you. Let's cite our sources. Thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, you're this tiny little community. You're easily overlooked, the prophet writes. But don't let that bother you. Out of you will come the greatest honor that could ever come any community. A governor, capital G, Messiah, capital G, the king, capital K, that will rule all Israel, that will rule all of the people by divine command and ordination. So the scribes and the Pharisees, all of these priests, these chief priests, they too now have this news, and they have the evidence. There's been a celestial event. There has been outside witness, and that's been backed up by the king's concern. So they have all the same indicators. They have all the same road signs. And then on top of that, they have the word of God. And even if they 
went and looked, and it turned out that this was a false alarm, they knew where to go. They knew what to do. So why don't they investigate it? Why, in Luke's account, is the news brought to shepherds, not to the high priests? I sometimes wonder, every year, and I raise these very pertinent questions. Why is the good news brought to the shepherds? Why is it brought to a bunch of homeless, looked down upon transients? Shepherds were so despised, they were the bottom of the social class, they could not even give testimony in court because they were of, as we would say, no fixed address. Why does the good news of the gospel come to them first? Why doesn't it come to the palace? I mean, if Messiah is the king, why shouldn't his arrival be announced in the palace? Well, now we can clearly see because the palace hated him. All right, fine. So why isn't the news of Christ's birth then brought to the temple? He is the Son of God. He is God's anointed. He is the Christ. He is the great high priest. Well, it wasn't brought to the men running the temple because the men running the temple were ungodly. And worse, they knew it. See, they had all the knowledge. They had all the, the, the head knowledge. They had all the book knowledge, but they didn't have the heart knowledge. The chief priests and the scribes didn't go and see the Christ child. They didn't act on this news themselves because they were cowards. And they were cowards for two reasons. Firstly, even though they knew the Old Testament promise, they didn't believe it. They didn't have the courage to believe it. Because if they had gone and been confronted by it, here, finally, is Messiah born, but not among you, then what is that? That is a judgment. And the chief priests and the scribes were not brave enough to go and face the judgment that God was handing down on them by having Messiah not born amongst them. Messiah is born to the low. Messiah is born in the humble lest of estates. He is born in a place and to a position where, the, where he is accessible to the lowest. Where he's accessible to shepherds. The news is brought to those in society who are the most looked down upon. It is not brought to those who are the most looked up to. So what does that say about the godliness and the righteousness and the ultimate standing before God of those who think themselves at the top of the pile? That they're really not. Oh, my friends and hearers, hear me when I say to you that the Lord God has a delightful and joyful and thankful love of topsy-turvydom. Those who are at the bottom he elevates to the heights, while at the same time those who think themselves high are brought low. Those who consider themselves and lean on their own strength are made weak. Those who think themselves weak are given strength. So to not have Messiah be born in the temple, to not even have the news brought to the temple, is in fact a judgment on the men who are running the temple. God would rather bring the news of Messiah, he would rather have the first acknowledgers of Messiah, he would rather have the first worshippers of Messiah, he would rather have the first spreaders of Messiah's news be shepherds in the hills tending their flocks than you, the scribes and the chief priests of the nation. God regards shepherds in high esteem, and in doing so regards the scribes and the chief priests in low esteem. Well, better to not even go in that case. If you're a chief priest and a scribe, better to not even go and be confronted by the hollowness of their righteousness. They're cowards. 
they wouldn't face it. They wouldn't submit to it. Now they were not only cowards in terms of their own hollow righteousness, but they were also cowards in terms of not wanting to get on the wrong side of one of Caesar's bodyguards. Or rather, now they were not only cowards in terms of being too scared to face their own judgment and to come face to face with the hollowness of their own righteousness, but they were also cowards in the face that they were genuinely afraid to get in the way of Herod's daggers and those that would wield them. If they had gone and acted on this news, not only would they have been confronted with their own righteousness, but now they would be in a political dilemma. Because the chief priests and the scribes that are talked about here would have been members of the governing council of Judea at that time, what is called the Sanhedrin. Now something else you should know about Herod, when he first came and cemented his rule, he not only got rid of Doris and his son and married a better woman to cement it, but he also purged the local government. We have this. This is taken, uh, let me quote you this, out of the Jewish Encyclopedia. This happened when Herod came back to town around 37 BC. Quote, Herod inaugurated his reign with acts of vengeance and cruelty. Forty-five of the most wealthy and prominent of uh, Antigonus's, he was a, a local noble who was ruling them, 45 of his most prominent partisans were executed and their estates confiscated in order to fill the empty treasury. Herod's agents showed themselves so greedy as to shake the dead bodies in order that any gold hidden in their shrouds might be disclosed. Close quote. So, Herod comes to power, first thing you do, you get rid of anybody who was loyal to the old guard and then we'll take their money and then we'll spend their money, and we'll even make sure that they don't hide any money. But there was something else that Herod did when he came to power. Again, let me quote this out of the Jewish Encyclopedia. Quote, all the members of the Sanhedrin, with the exception of two of them, Polio and Shemaiah, were slain. Close quote. So when Herod came to power, not only did he get a better wife, not only did he kill the local nobility that might have stood against him, but he absolutely murdered the government of the people. Now the Sanhedrin, just so you know quickly, was a governing council of 71 members, and it was comprised of priests and Levites, and there would have been a few ordinary Jews in here, but even those ordinary Jews would have been members of very uh, well-respected families that would have been able to trace their lineage into the priestly uh, the priestly families. Right? So it's really a political and also a religious council. It's also the high court. It's the supreme court in the land. And the first thing that Herod does is of those 71 members, he kills 69 of them. And then he installs people who aren't going to rise up against him, who aren't going to rule against him, who aren't going to move against him, who won't support those who might decide to move against him. He, it's all part and parcel of him taking total control of the land. Straight up murder. So, if you are a high priest now, here in Matthew 2, and you go and you act on this, you might be not only compelled to face your own righteousness, you're going to be compelled to support Messiah as king. You are going to, if you go, embroil yourself, either now or in the years to come, you are going to embroil yourself in a bloody political morass. Because the Sanhedrin was part Supreme Court, they were part Parliament, they were part Church Ruling Council. In fact, their powers could be broken down like any government. They had judicial powers. They could actually try false prophets and rebellious elders and even other high priests. They had religious powers in that these are the men who supervise the rituals, including the, the Day of Atonement, the Yom Kippur liturgy. And, and the whole, oh, this is fascinating. These would also be the men who had political power in that it was the job of the Sanhedrin technically, to appoint the high priest and the king. Of course, this was not a power that they got to exercise under Rome 
Caesar appoints the king, but on the books and in the fiber of their construction is the power to proclaim and appoint the king. They also got to declare war. They could, if they wanted, expand the territory of both Jerusalem and the temple. But it's this power. So if the scribes here mentioned and the high priests here mentioned go, and yes, it's finally true, Messiah the king has come, they have to back the king, which means that they are going to be in opposition to a very bloodthirsty Herod. And so again, their cowardice comes to the fore. Better not to go in the first place. Some of them will just not go. And by not going, they will not be confronted with the hollowness of their own righteousness. They are too afraid to face it. By not going, they will not be involved in a potentially bloody political overthrow. Their cowardice keeps them safe of it. And so they don't go. And as it turns out, as John would write in decades later, it probably wouldn't have mattered if they had gone. Even if they had, they wouldn't have believed. John 10, 26, this is Jesus himself, three decades later, confronting maybe even some of those very same, if they would have been elderly by this point, but the same religious leaders, the same scribes, the same Pharisees. John Oh, let me, give you, let me give you three examples here. John 8, John 8, 45, Jesus straight up tells them, I tell you the truth, ye believe me not. Why don't they believe him? Well, look at the previous verse, John 8, 44. You, he says this to the Pharisees, you are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh his own. He is a liar and the father of it. And I tell you the truth, you believe me not. They were saying, oh, Abraham is our father. He says, no, if Abraham was your father, you would believe in me. Because the prophets spoke of me. And here I am fulfilling everything that they said. So even if they had gone... They would not have believed John 10. Again, Jesus says to them, these religious leaders, the scribes, the Pharisees, you believe not because you are not of my sheep. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. Something happens. They hear me, they perk up. They respond properly. They follow. You don't because you're not of my sheep. Even John 5 I ended up doing these slightly out of order, but even John 5, again, Jesus tells them, you search the scriptures, right? You, you live, the scribes, the Pharisees, you live with your nose in the scriptures because you think in them that you have eternal life, which is technically true, but they, they don't have eternal life of their own. They point to me. They testify, he says, of me. And I am the one that brings and gives eternal life. And verse 40 in John 5, verse 40, And ye will not come to me, that ye might have life. You won't come. They won't come in 30 years. They didn't come now at his birth. And they didn't come because they were cowards. They knew that in coming they would be confronted with something and they didn't want to be confronted with it. They knew that in coming they would become committed to something and they didn't want to be committed to it. Because it would overthrow their worldview. Because it might bring them low for their own good. And so in their cowardice, they avoid the whole problem by not coming in the first place. So we've looked at enemies. There are enemies of the good news. There are those who hear the good news and don't act on it because of their own cowardice. And incidentally, over the course of the Gospels, we see many of those who started as cowards become flat-out enemies in that they eventually decide they have to murder Jesus. They have to get rid of him. They're the ones who actually arranged to have him crucified. Cowards become enemies, so, but there are enemies, there are cowards, ah, but then there are believers. It's not all doom and gloom. There are believers. 
and oddly enough, talk about the love of topsy-turvydom. The believers come from outside the system entirely. These are foreigners. They're not Jews. They're from the East. They um, very likely came out of the area that we would know as Iraq now. They came out of former Babylon. They may have had some exposure centuries previously when the Jews were in exile. Remember, think of Daniel. Daniel, all the prophecy that came to Daniel, the writings of Daniel. They may have been somewhat familiar with what was going to happen, what was promised to happen through that, but they have come. They're totally outside the system. And make no mistake, these men are pagans. They are straight out pagans. The only reason they have come is that there has been a celestial event, whatever it is, this star that they see in the sky, and it has been made known to them what this star is leads to, and so they come. Now, it was not unusual in the ancient world for men such as these to come to the birth of any king, to, in some instances, to validate the kingliness and the right to rule of whoever had been born by their showing up and giving their stamp of approval. And oddly enough, that is exactly what happens here. Jesus Christ's right and validity as king is shown in the arrival of these outsiders, these initial non-believers. But they come, and what happens? They follow the star, they find the infant Christ, and they, verse 10, rejoice with exceeding great joy. And they come into the house, and here is Mary, his mother, and the young child. See, he's, he's, he's not an infant wrapped in swaddling clothes. Some time has passed, but he's not yet two. We know this because Herod, right, he, he orders the murder of everybody two and under to make sure he casts that net as wide as he can. So here is the infant Christ. And note their response. Note the response of believers. First off, it's joy verse 10, it's exceeding great joy, which we have already touched on several weeks ago. But note at verse 11, they fall down and they worship him. They worship him. Believers are not enemies. They don't respond with hate or derision. And believers, although they may be afraid, are ultimately not cowards in that they are unafraid to submit to him, even if it means their own abasement. They fall down. These men plant themselves on their knees and their faces, and it doesn't end there. They worship him. They don't just acknowledge here is born a great human king. They worship. They acknowledge his divinity. They acknowledge that this child is not only from God, but is God. How did they know that? Well, they there's only one way it could have happened. This knowledge was gifted them from heaven. And so we are right to call them wise men. In this sense, they're wise enough to come. They're wise enough to not give in to cowardice. They're wise enough to not be enemies. They're wise enough in that they recognize Christ not only for who he really is, but they are also wise enough to see why he has come. And the proof of that is in their gifts. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. You say, Brayden, what are these? Ah, they're part and parcel of every pageant. But have you ever considered them? There's nothing in the Bible by accident my friends, there's no detail that's in here without deeper meaning and revelation. 
Well, they bring him gold because that's a kingly gift. Kings are the ones in this day and age. They're not only the possessors of gold, they're actually the minters of gold. When you became king, when you became even Caesar, one of the first things you did was that you got rid of the old currency and you published new currency with your face on it. So they bring him gold. The gold attests to Christ's kingship, his true kingship. They bring frank incense. It's not frankincense, it's frank incense. They bring sweet-smelling things, scents that you would burn in the temple. This is a symbol of his high priestliness, of that aspect of his coming, of that facet of Messiah, that office that he would claim. He would be king, he would be high priest. Say, so Brayden, what's myrrh? It's myrrh. I've actually seen myrrh, tiny chunks of it. It smells like pine resin. And that's very apt because myrrh is actually a hardened resin from a particular tree that is indigenous to the Arabian Peninsula. Very difficult to get. It was worth a lot of money, myrrh. Myrrh was very sweet smelling. It was uh, difficult to get. And most importantly, it was used to embalm dead bodies. Decades later, after Christ is taken off of the cross, he is, thanks to the one Pharisee, Nicodemus, who came to saving faith, Christ's body is, the Gospels tell us, buried with 70 pounds of myrrh. This is a desert environment. There's no embalming. You die within a few hours. You start to, as Lazarus did, stinketh. And so to offset the smell of decaying corpse, they would pack you in sweet-smelling myrrh. The Magi bring gold because he's a king. They bring frankincense because he's the great high priest. They bring myrrh because this child has been appointed to die. They bring myrrh because here, toddling before them with Mary his mother is, as John the Baptist would so aptly say, the lamb that comes to take away the sins of the world. Well, how do lambs take away sin in this day and age? They are slain. And their blood is poured out in atonement for the people. Nobody would have known this better than the scribes and the Pharisees and the chief priests. They were the ones who did it year after year. They were the ones in charge of the Yom Kippur, of the Day of Atonement. They would have slain the Passover lambs. More proof of their cowardice to come and find and seek and meet and put themselves in subjection to the one who had come to die and shed his blood so that the sins of the people who believe would be assuaged not just for a year but forever. Believers know who Christ is. Believers put themselves under subjection to him. Believers have a fully orbed understanding not only of who he is, but why he has come and what it is that he has achieved. Which is why God warns them for their own safety and for the child's safety, don't go back to Herod. It's not part of my plan. So they go back to their own country another way. There are enemies, there are cowards. But praise God, there are believers. Which are you? Which are you? This Christmas Eve? Oh, I know many of you. I know many of you are believers. That's why you approach this message. That's why you approach this season with thanks and joy. Exceeding great joy, 
Your salvation has already come. Your salvation has already been gifted to you. Your sins aren't counted against you anymore. You are now sprinkled with Christ's blood. When, when Almighty God, when, when God the Father looks at you, he no longer sees an enemy. He no longer even sees a coward. He doesn't even see someone at enmity with him. He sees his adopted child because he sees only the blood of Christ, which pays for all of your sins. There's no more gulf between God and the believer. Oh, but I worry this evening. You can't see you can't see my tears, but you might be able to hear it in my voice. I worry this evening for those of you who are cowards. And I really worry for those of you who are enemies. Cowards, you will ultimately, unless you find the courage and pray to be given the courage to put yourself under submission to overcome your cowardice, you will eventually drift into enemy territory, and you do not want to be an enemy of Christ. You do not. Because the enemies of Christ, the enemies of God, their sins are held against them. They are not covered by the blood. They are not. I will not bring you some universalist message of goodwill. Uniformly. That we're all going to heaven. This Christmas Eve. That is not what I have been called to bring. But instead I bring you the message of reconciliation. I bring you the gospel in the same way that the angels brought it to the shepherds on the hill. I bring you the good news. It's Christmas Eve. And a Savior has been born even unto you. In fact, especially unto you, enemies and cowards. All you have to do is believe. Do you believe it? Do you believe that the Word was made flesh? Do you believe that Christ descended from out of heaven? Was, as Charles Wesley wrote in that Christmas hymn, pleased as a man with men, capital M, to dwell do you believe, as John said, that Christ is, that Jesus is and was the Lamb who came to seek and save sinners, to shed his blood and take away the sins of all the world, all the different kinds of people in the world? It doesn't matter where they come from. It doesn't matter what their backgrounds are. It doesn't matter what they've done. Enemies and cowards, I am pleading this evening for your souls. Believe in this child. Believe in who he is. Believe in what he has done. Join the rest of us in our exceeding great joy. Come and join the rest of us in being reconciled, in being enemies no more in having a perfect love that casteth out whatever fear controls you and defines you. Come to Christ. Fall down. Worship Him. And be counted amongst the wise. God bless each and every one of you. And from the Campbell household into each of yours, we wish you the merriest of Christmases and the peace of Christ. Amen.